All right, so we're in the book study. We've been in the book of James. Uh, it's taken us a little while to finish chapter 1. So tonight we're going to start in James chapter 2. It's on the front of your bulletin. It's going to be James chapter 2, verse 1 is where we, we, will, we will begin. I had intended on us getting through verse 13. I think we can do that. Here's kind of the issue. Tonight we don't have a three-point sermon. We have two questions and a point. Uh, <clears throat> we have two questions and a point, and when we get to the questions, I will ask the questions, and, and you don't have to answer the questions out loud. But you should reflect on the questions because this is, this is biblical teaching from the Word of God that we want to adhere to. So if we're adhering to the biblical Word of God, then we will receive the benefits of the biblical Word of God. If you are outside the confines of Scripture, then you cannot count on the blessings of Scripture. So we're going to go to James chapter 2. I'll begin in verse 1. Oh. Okay. The title was, Are We Partial? Now here's, here's kind of the issue. So this is... This is Wednesday night, so this is the core group of the church on Wednesday night. These are people who have been in church for a very long time, have a very good understanding of God. <clears throat> Peyton, if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask. We just, you just don't hold back, okay? And if you want to say amen, you can say amen. The only thing we don't let you do is you can't jump and shout, okay? All right. Kurt, you can jump and shout. Go. All right, so... <laughs> Are we partial is the actual title of the message tonight. So in this particular instance, we'll start in James chapter 2, verse 1, and then we will read the Word of God, and then we will see if we are applying the Word of God. And I want you to apply the Word of God to your life. Don't tell me what your husband is doing. Don't tell me what your spouse is doing. Don't tell me what your neighbor is doing. But reflect on this as a personal reflection. So in this particular instance, this is written by God to us. So it says, James chapter 2, verse 1, My brethren... Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. I did not look up the word partiality because I think we can all pretty much agree on what that means. Somebody want to tell me what the definition of partiality is? Favoritism. Very good. So that was like three different people said favoritism. So in this particular instance, we have instructions from God to the church because he says, My brethren, so he's talking to us, and he says, Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Verse 2. For if there should come into your assembly, again he's talking to Christians, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. So he's asking us, if someone comes in here... If someone comes to New Colony Baptist Church, if they both come on the same day and one of them comes in dressed really nice and he's wearing his Sunday best and the other one looks like he just stumbled out of the bar and he just happened to roll into the parking lot, do you treat those people exactly the same way? I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because we're only in verse 2. Verse 3. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. Continuing in verse 3. And say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. This is a letter from God to a church asking a church to not show partiality. And he's given them a very real world example. Chris, are we at question number one? Okay, verse four. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Now, question number one. Peyton, I like the explosion to make sure nobody sleeps while I'm preaching. It's just, <clears throat> do we do this? Do we, does New Colony Baptist Church show partiality when people come into the service? And i got to be honest with you, in some instances, I think some of us are really good at not doing this, but I don't think that we're 100% on board yet. I don't think that we're all there. And, and I will express to you why I believe that is true, because we live in a very small community. We do. We live in a very small community where everybody knows everybody, and everybody talks about everybody. Amen? Amen. Okay. So when you're talking about someone, sometimes that person will overhear, or even worse than that, some, the person that they were talking to will come back and will tell you. And I will tell you that it's gotten back to me several times that people inside our congregation have actually said, I don't know where he finds those people. So what you're saying is you know where we're at and you can be here consistently? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Do 
This is a letter to the church to teach the church what we're not supposed to do that is 2,000 years old that we can sit here and read today and most of us will admit, ooh, we're guilty. Do we show partiality when people come into the congregation of God? In that particular instance, I want you guys to understand, if God chooses to send someone to us, then God chooses to send that person to us so that we can receive them into his family, so we can treat them like a brother and sister in Christ. And when they come into this particular congregation, they should feel as though they are loved and appreciated and respected, and we should be glad to see them. And the honest truth is sometimes when we show up, we don't even want to see each other. Amen? Not everybody said amen, but most of you. <laughs> Rocky, did you have something you wanted to add, sir? <laughs> so really and truly, i got to be honest with you guys. Sometimes when I'm supposed to be coming in here to preach, I'm like, oh. So and so is going to say such and such as soon as I get to that particular verse. Where's Brother Tim at? <laughs> this is one of those things that, yes, I, I think if we all admitted it, that we are guilty of it to some degree. But this is, a re this is a reflection from God to the church telling us, don't be that way. So if we can sit here and we can admit that we have done this somewhat in the past, whether you want to admit it was you or whether you want to say it was somebody else within the congregation... What we're saying is not that we're terrible, awful, rotten people. What we're saying, ladies and gentlemen, there's room for improvement. Yes. We can do better. Yes. And if we can do better, then we're learning from the Word of God. And if we learn from the, the Word of God and then we do better, then we're blessed. Yes. But if we just sit here and go, why is he picking on me? Why is that preacher always picking on me? Can't he find someplace else to preach? <laughs> If that's our thought process, then we're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong according to the Word of God because the Word of God was very clear. If you come in in nice clothes or if you come in in rags, we're supposed to be happy to see you. Amen? Amen. There's a couple of empty seats in here. We could have a few more people. Amen? Amen? But when they show up, we have to be happy to see them because God's sending them to us. So if we are blessed by God, why would we complain? I mean, except for the fact that we have a lifetime habit and pattern of actually complaining about the blessings of God. But if that's you, if you have a lifetime pattern and habit of complaining about the blessings of God, you can do better. We can agree that every person that God sends to us is precious and that those people need to be loved, received with grace and kindness and welcomed into the family. So let's just, let's, let's just remember question one. Remember verses one through four. Remember this is the word of God, that the preacher didn't sit home and make this up. I'm reading to you out of the word of God. I'm not coming in here trying to pick on anybody. I am coming in here trying to make sure that we as a corporate body understand the instructions from God and then we implement them. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to make you feel blessed because God has allowed us to be here and he is sending us opportunities to receive blessings. All we have to do is remember when they get here, woo, they're a blessing. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Those little kids that run down the hall and make a lot of noise and disturb us, they're blessings. Those adults who show up occasionally and grumble while they're here, they're blessings. They're blessings because God has chosen for us to share with them his grace. All we have to do is do it. Verse number five. Doesn't get much better, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go on this theme for a while. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? This is not a first world problem, ladies and gentlemen. This is a problem in the church from the very beginning. There is a problem that the church has had, and we, we like people to come in who are like us. We like them to understand the things that we understand. We want them to know that when they come here, that somehow they're magically just supposed to automatically know we're going to do three hymns, the preacher's going to be on for 40 minutes, and then we go to lunch. I just can't find that in Scripture. So if Miss Krista wants to sing five hymns, we'll probably do five hymns that day. 
And if the preacher's long-winded, we probably will get out late. It doesn't happen real often, right? <laughs> Nobody wanted to come. All right. Listen, my beloved brethren. God is calling us his beloved brethren, and he's telling us to listen. And this is what he wants you to hear. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. It's easy for us to love his children if we remember that they're his children. It's hard for us to love anybody if we just base it on the way they show up. Because I got to admit, the first time I came to church, I was a terrible, awful, wretched sinner. And I still am. We're going 40 years on now, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Verse number six. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. He's calling us out in the first century from the very beginning. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man because you have not received him the way you received the rich man. And he says, doesn't the rich man, isn't he the one that actually causes you the problems? You, you, might not, you might not see that yet. You might not understand that. But I will tell you inside the church, this is how things operate. Someone will come into the church and, and they will think, okay, this is great. I will come into the church and I will pay my tithe as long as they do what I want them to do. And as soon as they stop doing what I want them to do, then I'm going to stop giving them my tithe. As though they have some amount of money that gives them control over God. It's just not how it works. You know the great thing about that is you never see a poor man come into church and think that he can buy his way into anything. <laughs> and he's calling us out in the first century. Verse number seven. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? And he's telling us, that's the guy you picked. That's the guy you wanted. And does he not come in and oppress you? And does he not blaspheme the name by which you were called? Verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Now he's reminding us of the teachings from the very beginning. That what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. And we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. And most of us are really good at pampering ourselves or spoiling ourselves and not necessarily even paying attention to our neighbor. Some of us have neighbors we might not even know their names. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That means if you live next to Hannah, she's not even paying attention. I called her name. Hey, John. How you doing, man? Okay, all right. Hey, Hannah. I was just talking about you, but you missed all of it. She'll have to go back and watch the video. Verse 9. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. He's calling us out in the first century as a church, telling us that if we do this, then you are a sinner. And when I asked you guys earlier, do we do this? A large portion of you said, yes, we do. What does that make us? Sinners. Sinners. Luckily, Jesus was aware of the fact that we were not going to get it right. So he went to the cross and he shed his blood. So we could receive his grace. But we should not dishonor that grace with just 2,000 years of practice of doing it wrong. Verse number 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble at one point, he is guilty of all. That's almost a whole hour of message right there. See, he's not saying, well, but I was better than so-and-so. He's saying it doesn't matter if you're better than so-and-so. You're supposed to keep the entire law. And if you're not keeping the entire law, then you're guilty. And if you're guilty, then you need a Savior. And if you're guilty and you need a Savior, then there's one person in this world who can help you, and his name is Jesus. 
And if you know Jesus and you know he's the only person that can help you, then you don't count on your own good works. You don't count on your money. You don't count on your spouse. You don't count on your job. You don't count on your prestige. You just fall at the cross and you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then you're miraculously saved. And that miraculous salvation is available to the poor man when he walks in the door, the same as the rich man. There's no partiality. You can be male or you can be female. You can be tall or you can be short. You can be underweight or you can be overweight. We're not supposed to show any partiality in the house of God. And he called us out from the very beginning saying, don't do that. Are we at question number two now? Oh, it, those speakers work really well on Wednesday night. <clears throat> Are we striving to keep the whole law? Is that the goal? Or do we just wake up in the morning and go, man, as long as I'm better than so-and-so, I guess I'm okay. Or maybe it's not that I have to be better than so-and-so, but I can be a little bit better today than I was yesterday. Yesterday I was just a holy terror, so today I'm only going to be like a half a terror. Like I just want to be bad for the morning time, but by come noon I'll be okay when I have lunch. Are we getting up in the middle of the morning saying, you know what, today I'm going to be partly Christian. Are we waking up motivated going, woo, today is the day God has blessed me. He woke me up. Now I'm going to go out and do something wonderful. And some of you are like, where am I going to go, Claude? I don't care. But do it wonderful. I don't care if you're in Walmart or Brookshire's or the dollar store. Be the Christian God created you to be. Be the Christian that Jesus died on the cross to save. Don't be that terrible, awful, wretched sinner that, that the devil has convinced you is just okay. Because it is not okay. He was very specific that we should not show partiality. And yet 2,000 years later, in the church, in his church, we mostly all agreed, yep, we still do that. So strive today to be better. Verse 11, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Think about any example that God could have used for the church. Remember, he wrote this letter to the church. And what is he giving us as an example? He's saying, you guys are showing partiality. The church is showing partiality. Now, let me tell you, it doesn't matter if you commit adultery or if you commit murder. And remember, he's talking to the church. So he's talking to the church that shouldn't be doing either of these two things. And he's saying, you want an example? Here's your example. The same man who said thou shalt not commit adultery is also the one that said you should not commit murder. And then he goes on in verse 11 and he says, Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. He wrote that to the church. He wrote that to the church and says, okay, so if you don't commit adultery but you do commit murder, remember he's talking to the church. He's talking to the church in the first century. So this is not a time when there would have been a lot of murders that were happening. So he's using an example, the most horrible thing that you could possibly use, the two of them, and he's saying, hey, one of these is not better than the other. You guys didn't know where I was going with that, but this is where God's trying to teach us. Each of these laws that he has given us is to be lived up to all of the time. There's no degrees of right and wrong. There's either right or wrong. Verse 12. I'll finish because I hear the, the kids. I still have three minutes. <laughs> so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Point number one for tonight's message. That one was loud. Thank you, Ms. Krista. We should exhibit mercy. We should exhibit mercy towards each other. We should exhibit mercy to those people who are just coming in for the first time. We should do our best to live our lives completely sold out to God, showing mercy because we have received mercy. None of us did it right. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us. We've all received that mercy.
So let's show that mercy wherever you go for the rest of your life. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to get through the prayer list and to call out their names before your throne. Thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to open your word and to study. I pray, dear God, that it touches our hearts and touches our minds and never leaves us, dear God, so we can do what is right and good and just for your glory. Amen.